the basics of argumentation. Yay. There we go. Aha. <laughs> Good learn. How to move the pieces around. Okay. <laughs> The things I do to have a funny, stupid, silly moment. All right. Um, defining a formal argument. So formal argument. So these are things that you can take back to your actual classrooms. You can always use this to ensure that you're doing whatever you need to do in an essay or an argumentative essay. Um, so a formal argument includes a conclusion, the premise, and the assumptions. The conclusion is um, the thesis. Um, is the main idea or the main argument? What, it, what are you trying to prove? Um, what is the author or the speaker? What are you trying to prove to your audience or your reader? The premise, the premise is are the reasons or the evidence um, that the author or speaker gives to support the conclusion, the conclusion, excuse me, I can't talk today. And the assumptions, the assumptions support the conclusion, but unlike the premise, they are unstated. You cannot see them. They link the premise to the conclusions. This should form your introductory thesis body and concluding points. So, you know, when you're doing your introduction, again, you should follow this. Um, when you're doing your body and your conclusion, you should follow all of this same formal argumentation uh, formula. So, um, debate argument structure. So when you're thinking about argument structure, when you're creating your arguments, you should think about the claim, um, which is, you know, should be posed within your tags and your evidence. And throughout your, your debate, your claim is an assertion that will be proven using your evidence. The, the claim should be um, working to support the thesis. So it should be working to support your larger, your larger narrative and your larger argument. Your support or your evidence is an example that supports the claim. Evidence can be a quote, fact, a data point, or anecdote. The context of the evidence to the claim and the thesis. So, you know, um, you know, your evidence should add context to the um, to the claim and the thesis that you're ma the making. You know, if if you're saying twelve billion people have died, then if you're making an argument that this vaccine doesn't work and you say 12 million people have died, of course, that creates context for the argument you're trying to make. How do you understand text and data? Well, it's facts and statistics. Um, and it doesn't have to be just um, qualitative facts in terms of numbers. It can be qualitative facts. Sometimes what um, I have tend to do a lot of times through the debate is make note of a lot of historical events and making note of those historical facts um, can sometimes draw um, points to, to larger arguments that I'm trying to make. Um, so um, facts and, uh, and, stat, uh, and statistics collected for reference or analysis. So, you know, based on those factual occurrences or those factual conditions or the, those factual numbers, you know, what can we draw from, from, or what can we infer from, you know, what we see there? An explanation. So an explanation, you know, it clarifies the evidence for the reader. So it takes a moment to try to, you know, re-explain for a moment um, what has been explained already. So it just paraphrases, just, you know, in, in some short form explanation, which helps connect the evidence to the claim. So once you read your claim, you provide your evidence, you have to state why you have used that evidence to back up your claim. So that, you know, um, is very important. And then you have a warrant. The warrant addresses the so what of the larger point and helps to illustrate why the claim and the evidence is significant. So, you, you know, when you're, a lot of times y'all don't make, um, warrants you need to you know when you make an argument you want to say well why is it significant well why is it important why are you making that particular argument you know um why is making this in particular argument outweigh or you know create further understanding or solve better or whatever you're doing why is what you're narrating important and how does what you're narrating um in total you know justifiable by your explanation, your text, your data, your support, and your claim. And it creates um, clarity for um, the the crucial, the grid of the debate, the purpose, and the value of what you're 
intending to illustrate. So we've talked about this in the how to boost your speaker point um, lecture, but again, I just want to um, also help you understand that this is also a way to help you um, understand, you know, again, you know, how to um, invoke certain things within your speech act. So logos is, you know, how we appeal to logic, you know, rationality, the validity, again, the statistics, uh, you know, the facts, you know, what comes in sequential order, you know, those things. Um, that just And then sometimes logic also appeals to ethics. Logic also can appeal to pathos. These things should work in tandem with each other. Um, and, you know, the, again, that helps you, um, it helps, you know, bolster your persuasion um, and your ability to have appeal, but also, um, you know, make sure arguments seem comprehensive. Um, the next one that will help with the comprehend the comprehensiveness of your speech act is your ethos, um, your ability to pull on the virtue um, and the, the, the what's to be valued um, in the debate space, post the debate space, whatever you, you think that should be valued. Um, and, and, you know, you should, that is the ethos of the debate. Um, then you have pathos. This is, you know, how do you provide when they, when a lot of times when we talk about should in debate, that is the, it suggests moral need. Anytime you say you should do this judge, you should consider evaluating our plan. You should co consider not doing the plan because this is what the world looks like. That is pulling at those, um, um, the judge's pathos, you know, the desire to to create um, empathy or uh, um, do good moments or to resolve some moment of injustice, right? So um, those arguments are what we call arguments that relate to pathos. So arguments have function, and, and so you should, you know, think about how our how are arguments being used to run across a chessboard or a debate flow? Um, so you have deductive um, arguments. So that is a logical process in which conclusions is based on the concordance of multiple premises um, that are generally assumed to be true. Deductive reasoning is sometimes referred to a top-down logic. So it creates some, you know, you have these general um, conclusions and it looks at um, how they have some concordance with each other and you build multiple um, premises based on that and then you build some you know general conclusion and an idea um, larger idea of what's to be true and again that you know tends to have a top down because you're looking at the the um, the general the kind of shallow um, things that are going on um, inductive reasoning or, or inductive logic is a method of reasoning in which a body of observations is, is considered. Um, so this is kind of more specific. Um, it is derived to a general principle. So you have something more specific, but you still have some general, some general principle. So let's say you say, oh, Russia's um, doing bad at war with the United States. And so then you say, you know, China is gonna be the same thing. So you look at something specific and you create some general specific observation. Critical reasoning is the rational process through which um, you obtain and interpret and use knowledge and facts and data while exercising logical thinking and analyze, analyzing issues, making proper decisions to ultimately solve problems. So like that example I made about uh, Russia fighting, you know, the U.S. can sometimes be difficult. So that means it's going to be the same with China because maybe they're both communism, but that's a general situation, right? So I've made, that would be um, inductive, right? Um, critical would be like, oh, well, you know, China, you know, has specific things that are going on within its, within its, you know, sovereignty that is different than Russia. 
Um, and just because Russia is not able to resolve these conflicts with the U.S. doesn't mean China doesn't have more hegemony, right? Like that would be, uh, you know, critical reasoning where you're thinking about, you know, the um, into the specific independent variables that would lead to that specific um, observation. Philosophy. So philosophy is the study of the fundamental, the fundaments of nature, of knowledge, reality, existence, especially we consider it as an academic discipline. So this is kind of like, you know, does God exist? What is reasoning? Like that is philosophy. So those are arguments you will see also in debate that kind of um, poke at, you know, um, why things have come to be rather than trying to have uh, assumptions, it questions assumptions, and it questions those premises. You have casual arguments, a casual argument. Um, these are, hold on, let me make sure. Yeah. You have casual arguments. Casual arguments um, is a type of argument used to persuade someone or a group of people that one thing has caused something else. So, you know, you casually say, hey, this is going to lead to this. Um, a rebuttal argument is when you're responding to a statement that tends to make a claim or criticism that um, you are opposing with arguments suggesting that the opponent's arguments aren't true. Proposal arguments is when you are um, sh um, suggesting um, a solution to a problem, outlining details of the proposal and providing good reasoning to support that strategy or plan. An evaluation argument is where you're tending to look at the effectiveness, the efficiency, whether a plan is good or bad, whether looking at a plan is helpful or harmful, right? You should be doing that, especially when you're doing an impact calculus um, um, to help the judge evaluate. And even when you're thinking about the pathos or thinking about the assumptions of debate, if you're running um, a critique or if you're thinking about um, even how we conduct certain things in debate, um, if you're running framework or thinking how, you know, any of those things, um, you know, you really need to be um, expressing to the judge, you know, not just the importance of their aesthetic, why they're ethical, but, you know, also suggesting that they're practical and have good use and function. And so, um, you know, just pulling at the, you know, pulling at people's heartstrings it's not just a matter of like, oh, this is a good idea, just because it's a good idea. You should be explaining the 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 functionality of why it's a good idea. Don't I don't know this man's name, but the Tolman argument is an effective way of getting to know how and why levels of the argument to to understand the levels of the arguments that we read. Um, it gives um, it goes into sections so you can understand like how things work. Um, um, I guess, in context with each other. So there's um, claim reasons and evidence um, so that you're able to make decisions from those different parts and how they work together. Where Jurian arguments is a form of argument that um, aims to establish a middle ground. So it allows you to look at both parties. Um, a lot of times this is when you're doing switch side debate. Um, even, you know, when you're, you know, you know, when you're doing your, we meet arguments, right? When you're like, all right, um, I see what you said about T. You said we're not, we're violating the topic. No, but actually we're not violating the topic. Um, hold on, I can't see. We're not violating the topic, right? We meet your violation, you know? So, you know, Rajurian arguments is where you're kind of, you know, establishing middle ground. You're kind of negotiating the argument and, you know, maybe you're doing some concessions. Right, so those are Rogerian arguments. Classical Western arguments, um, this is the style of argument where your goal of the speaker or the writer is to convince, or the author, the audience of something. Um, so again, this is where you're tying, again, those ethos, pathos, and logos to help play a role in the debate, to help persuade and utilize um, the functional um, parts of the argument to move parts of the debate. This is actually... We're at 458. Okay. I have a lot more to say than what I thought. Okay. Um, remember when you're in the debate and you're looking at the flow and you're trying to figure out, remember to begin with the summary of the arguments. Remember what you said. Remember what the opposing team said. Remember to when you're saying that they say, I say, they said, we said, 
um, when you do, you should be doing that when you're going through your speech. You should be trying to show where the switch side is happening. Um, you should notate the tag. This tag said this. This citation said this. I want you to understand that this ju juxtaposes my card over here that suggests this. Um, and um, notate the buzzwords that they're trying to use. If they say 10 million people die, you need to be like, no. If they say turn outweighs those really big buzzwords, you want to make sure responding to the clash of the, those big things within the debate. Also, make sure you're responding to the parts. That's the third. I, I read. I went down. I'm just going everywhere. The third part of this bulletin is remember your parts. Remember, I'm my card such and such response to the link argument, which is their such and such card. If y'all not doing that because you're not flowing, yeah, <laughs> this is why you're not clashing in some of these debates. Um, keep what they say, and I've said this before. It's not so much to say they say we said, and you know I used to do that too. But the the best and the most better debates that I've had is when a person does the nuance of this. It's not when you just say they said, we said, try to tell the judge what they should interpret it as, not what the other team says. Don't rephrase and um, surmise what the other team says. What you should be doing is create an interpretation, right, for yourself that the judge should feel entitled to to be persuaded to understand, right? So you should be um, managing the narrative of what the other team is saying. So don't just take what they say for granted, right? You say, you should be like, I know that the team claimed to make this argument, but they cannot make this argument because, right? And then, you know, you can start breaking some of the, their arguments down. Uh, so listen to what they're trying to intend to argue, argue within their claim, but continue to extend your arguments as you're responding to what they're saying. So um, ensure, like, remember, like, you're not just responding to what they're saying. You, you should be extending your arguments as you're responding to what they're saying. Again, you should make what they say something that you're saying, right? So they could be like, look, they tried to make this argument, but really this argument goes in my, my favor. You should really try to understand the nuances in the debate, really understand what the tags are trying to say, right? And also read the underlying and the, 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 the unhighlighted parts, right? the unhighlighted and the, un, un, and the parts that they have not underlined. Um, because um, they, the, they might be, you know, a lot of teams will you will you'll find teams clipping arguments you'll be like first of all this what is within this card doesn't even make sense is this clipped you know and, I, and there's been times where i'm like judge a team has clipped this card you cannot evaluate a card that they just clipped people be cheating right so sometimes you you can notice that stuff like that when you're like they say and, the, and then you can like they can't say this because they clipped this card right um or you want to ensure that maybe there is a difference between what the tag is saying what the cards are saying because they have not um underlined or you know created the correct context you know maybe they're trying to change the context so you know you need to ensure that again managing the narration of the debate is what you should be trying to do you should be trying to not just um paint the picture but ensuring that you're in order to paint the picture that you're managing what's being discussed in debate. And again, that's that moment of being the secretary in debate what we talked about. You should clean up what's happening in debate, you know, because a lot of teams, they're making mistakes. You should be like, judge, they didn't make a mistake here. So ensure that you're conveying the same message when you're pointing at, um, at, uh, when you're pointing at those mistakes, when you're narrating and being the secretary in debate and you're doing that, that cleanup and you're saying, judge, you know, this is here, that that is there, you know, you know, put my argument here when you're doing those things make sure that you're continuing to convey the same message even when you're on different sheets of paper sometimes you should be trying to have an overview that again like when we talked about like having all those argument functions and all those pieces all those arguments should help you with the larger umbrella of what you're saying when you have a t argument right and i've seen this happen as i've tried to express to y'all i've seen this happen when i was at jack Howe, right there's teams running t with k and I was like, this is what I've been suggesting for y'all to do because there was an, an initial larger story that they've been trying to tell since the get go of the one and C. So you should remember that. Don't stray away from the focal narrative of debate. Think about what's the focal narrative debate as um, Toya has reminded you 
Um, you should think about it from like that pyramid where, where you have um, the darker color blue and it goes into the, the well, no, you have the lighter color blue at top and it gets to the darker color blue uh, at the bottom or, or the point or the axis of the pyramid, that upside down pyramid that goes like, hold on, I can't do a pyramid today. You know how our pyramid goes. It's a triangle. <laughs> that triangle that's upside down. This, right? When you have this, right, it's, it's, it's lighter at the top. So you have your shallow arguments, right? You have the shallow arguments at the top. And then when you get to that point at the bottom of that pyramid, that's when the colors start to get darker. And, and that's what you should feel like to when you're giving your speeches. You should be like, judge, it should be making more sense to you towards the end of the rebuttal why you should vote for me. No, seriously, that should be the conviction in the debate. And, I've, and, I, and, and I know I've said this to you all, but I, literally I have made this statement in the debate. Judge, I'm eight minutes ahead in this debate. Look at this argument, look at this argument. They try to respond to this, but they can't respond to this because my argument already responded to it, right? And so you should be doing some, no, but I'm serious. You should be doing some of those preemptive strikes. You should be thinking about how your piece has already moved to answer those questions. Think about what is the focus of the debate? Because if you think about the focus of the debate, some of those, argu those um, arguments that have been made by your opposing team don't even matter. So you should, you know, figure out what is the, you know, again, that focus of the debate signal who is saying what in the debate round. So you should be signaling, they said this, we said this, you know, and signal like how those those words have meaning and how they play. Some of the things that you need to do, it's not just a matter of the words and the tag. Y'all need to be talking about specifically these cards. What are these cards saying? That's why y'all not winning the specifics or if, if you're the judges like y'all not being specific enough in these debates. Well, the, the way in which you'd be spe more specific in these debate rounds is talking specifically about the, ca the cards. My Joe Miller evidence doesn't meet the quota because it doesn't have a warrant. The, when they read this and such and such and such, you cannot flow this their way. They can't solve for this because this link argument that was supposed to be their Joe Miller evidence cannot function as a link argument because of such as, you know, whatever. You need to be signaling, signaling their words, interpreting it how you should interpret it for the judge, not what their interpretation is, what your interpretation is, because you should have gathered your evidence during cross-examination to figure out what you can deduct and what you can induct or what you can critically think about their argument so you can start poking those holes when you're setting up your, um, your thesis for your next speech. Because... You know, again, I really want to also strongly convey, um, and this will be something I'll repeat um, in one of the, um, uh, there will be a video called cross-examination in our refresher playlist, bottle um, YouTube page playlist um, about cross-examination, but I'll repeat it again here. I really hope that y'all moving forward, particularly in the open division, ben, uh, Daniel, I'm not talking about you. Everybody else who is not a novice, who's not their first year, please, I implore, I implore, that's a big word, which means I beg that you do not continue on debating tag team. You, If you're in the varsity division, you don't need tag team. And here's why, if you're looking at me crazy, you should not be tag team. You know why? Because you are you have a speech coming up. One of you have a speech coming up. So you should be prepping that those three minutes, your partner, you should have already discussed quietly with your partner and reviewing uh, quietly with your partner as the speech is ongoing. You should be like, yeah, did you get that argument? Yeah, I got that argument. Did they just say this? Yeah, they just said this. You, be, you should be sitting together, flowing together. Did you get that argument? Yeah, I got that argument, right? Because particularly, and then you want to, sometimes, sometimes I didn't need to look at my partner. I was just looking at my partner like, are you flowing? Because they just said that. I want to make sure you got that down. Right. Like you got to be on it, especially when it comes to spreading. So that time during cross sex and you can and you should be listening. Right. You can be like, let's say Ella, she's asking Sam questions. Ella just going, how do you solve? Well, this isn't really significant. Right. Or these conditions never happen. She's just going, going, going. And I think of something really quickly and I'm like, all right, let me write it down. If you do not write legible, my debate partner could not rate, um, be legible worth anything. My debate partner was messy. I've already said this before. <laughs> And I, I was not the person that created the strategies. I was the orator, right? I was the best at orating and the storytelling. I was a great one AR. I was very efficient. That's what I would group collect. I would, that secretary stuff I'm talking about, I was really good at that. Um, so, you know, my part of the job was really to organize our files and stuff like that. So ensure that, again, that y'all are working together and y'all build some type of vibe 
to really ensure that like, hey, if, if you if your debate partner doesn't, my, I would be like, when my debate partner stop at a point, I was like, stop passing me posters because it's not working for us. Because you keep sending me posts, just ask the question now and then get back to prepping. Right. That was more. So figure out y'all's vibe, really, um, to figure out how to and even when it comes to the flow, when you're thinking about how these pieces move together, you should be talking quietly together because that shows the judge that y'all already prepping before the prepping even needs to start. This is about looking like who's winning. Again, they say, I say, um, remember to say that you're disagreeing with their point. Um, you can say, you know, I heard that they said or that team said the one AC said. Um, you know, you want to, it says blend. You want to ensure that you're bending, not blend, not blend the arguments. You don't want to blend their arguments with yours. You want their arguments to seem juxtaposing to yours. So you want to bend the their arguments to meet your own um, need to win the debate. You want to say, they said this are the conditions, but if these are truly the conditions that are going to exist, this is even more reason why you should vote my side. Because if you vote for the negative, you will avoid this problem by the affirmative. Or, you know, if you vote for the negative, you won't get this resolution from the affirmative, right? So you can do it both ways. Frame the understanding. Point out the flaws and the fallacies. Don't just hit and run. Don't, don't, a lot of y'all be hitting and running in debates. You can't hit and run, all right? It needs to be in depth arguments. Make it make sure you're going over the claim, the warrant, the reasoning, the explanation with each part. That means you have to do claim, reason, and warrant for the uniqueness of a dissent, claim, reason, and warrant, um, and evidence for the link and for the impact. And you don't have to take them all out. Like again, you can just take out the link, you can take out the link and the uniqueness, and then you know, later in the debate, take out the impact. You should probably do all three just so you can take out the whole thing. But you know what I mean? But you know, you make the figure out what those decisions are. You know, sometimes me and my debate partner be like, if we take out the unique and link, if we really sometimes me and my debate partner be like, look, if we really take out the uniqueness and the link, we don't have to worry about the impact because we know we don't lead to it, right? So some of those decisions you don't have to really you can you can hit and run on certain things, but make sure you're not hitting and run on the larger narrative and the things that you have circled, you should be circling things on the flow again. This is and understanding how those par parts function and knowing. You know, what does uniqueness matter? What is the, why does the impact matter? So if you need to go back and if you don't know what I'm talking about right now and you're watching this video, we've already discussed this with that cheat sheet with Amy. It's posted on YouTube right now. It's called the Debate 101 Review. Review that one Debate 101 Review again and figure out what those parts are. So you can figure out how those parts may have fallacies within their warrant, within their reasoning and so forth and how to not just hit and run, but you're like really breaking it down how that argument doesn't stand to be true. Um, establish why your claims are important. Again, add, um, substantiate, substantiate your claims. Why is your argument significant? What is the purpose of you maintaining this link argument? You know, all those things. Why is Why are you reading this particular author? Does their position really have weight in this debate as an organic intellectual, as an academic intellectual, you know? You know, maybe you're using the three-tier method. You're doing my thing. You're doing all, all of it, right? Like. You got your organic, you got your personal narrative, you got, you know, why are you doing all those things? Okay, so some of this, sometimes y'all get to a point where, you know, you're trying to give your speech and it doesn't seem concise. Remember, this is teaching you about public speaking just for the lay world, not just within debate. So you should have introductory statements. Judge, before I start this debate, I wanna start off with my overview. Going into my overview, you know what I'm saying? Like y'all need to do stuff like that. Um, I, I'm leading with this point, Judge, in my overview. My thesis is, you know, this should be evaluated over everything. Moving on to, into specific arguments. The first thing on the flow is, right? Um, the larger arguments today I'm making is, you know, start with the facts. Pose a question. Judge, today, have they been, and I've seen Ella do this. Have they been able to respond to this question? No, they have not. I've seen you do this in your overviews, girl. You do a good job at it too. You'd be like, judge, have they ever been able to resolve this question in the debate? No. Or be like, judge, I've seen you do this as well, Ella. I've seen where you'd be like, have they answered this argument? And this was recently at the last tournament. You were like, they did not answer this argument. So judge, you know, you know, you can pose questions to the judge at the start of the debate to really tell that overarching story about like what is really, really significant in the debate and what, what was missed and what 
should have not been missed in the debate, right? And so you can pose questions, you can make an antidote, you can be like, this is still the fact. They have not been able to answer this fact that has remained in this debate, right? So, you know, the fact that they maybe dropped something or one of the facts from your citation or maybe the the um the, the what are the functional arguments, maybe one of those, um, I forgot what it's called, were jury in points that you made, or maybe the proposal point that you made they didn't, or maybe something that you rebutted, right? Or maybe one something that you evaluated they haven't responded to. So you want to make sure you are, you know, stating the facts of what happened also within the debate. You want to make transition statements. I'm moving on to the next flow, judge. I'm moving on to the next argument. Similarly to this argument, I'm going on to this piece of paper, right? I told you why they don't solve, but not only do they not solve, but plans like this that don't solve, they're also imperial um, to my critique. Togetherness, conciseness, connecting the dots, right? Um, then you will see in the following argument, right? So you saw that they didn't solve judge. You saw that they tried to do the same thing that didn't work in the Ukraine. And now they're trying to do this in, I don't know, um, Estonia, right? They're trying to do something that they did in Ukraine and Estonia. That's not going to work, Judge. You know that there's different ethnic situations. And be, and going on to my K flow, imperialism is the reason why they have been able to group people into generalized essentialist ideas, which has caused hierarchies and has caused colorism and all these things and racism and xenophobia. Like you know what I'm saying. So connect those dots in contrast to the plan, right? And then how you make transitional statements, you can be like my first, second, third, again, signposting afterwards, at last, before, during, you know, later, meanwhile, however, recently, all over. And then statements, you know, in conclusion, all in all, lastly, in general, those are the statements you can use. Um, e judge, even if you do not believe, right, the arguments that were made above, this still, fact still remains. And, you know, you want to still give an underview as well, not just an overview, an underview. You know, remind the judge again, what is the connection between A, B, and C? When you made your first argument, your second argument, when you made your link, in, uh, your uniqueness link in impact, your A, B, C, right? In conclusion, judge, I have my uniqueness, my link, my impact, just as an example. Your A, B, and C might not be that. Your A, B, and C, if it's a K, you know what your parts are. If you're doing topicality, you know your A is your de uh, definition. Right. So make sure you're, you're, you're and that will help that you be organized within your speeches, especially as it relates to the flow. And I know it's hard to do. I am not the best at it. And the reason why I'm not the best at it is because when you got five minutes <laughs> after that, after that block, you can't be doing it as much. There's a and, and a lot of judges know this. We excuse the one AR for that. Everybody else don't get no excuse. I'm sorry. Two in R, two in C's don't get no excuse. The one and R definitely don't get no excuse because you had a whole lot of time to prepare for the one and R. You had that two and C. You had the time before the two and C even started, right? So certain arguments you definitely want to make sure in order to help you out through the debate, make sure that you have those structures particularly there. Again, as I was talking about, what is signposting? Signposting is using phrases or letters uh, or um, to help the author, I mean, excuse me, help the audience or reader of a speech understand the flow of your presentation. Um, it ensures to know what flow sheets and what paper and which parts of an argument are being addressed. Um, you know, you, again, by numbers, again, be the secretary within the debate, um, keep your flows clean, make sure you, you're responding to the flows in an organized and clean way. You know, again, you wanna make sure that the judge is able to flow well. You should also be flowing well, you know, show the you judge you're doing what you're supposed to do, you know? If you again, if you look like you're winning, <laughs> some of y'all be like shaking up. You can't, y'all gotta stop being shaken up. It's about confidence. Just just zone in, just focus. Then act a fool, right? But focus. Um, so even when you think about they say, I say, also again, I think these sometimes are, in, are out of order, these slides. I feel like they are. Um, remember the even if and anticipate the objections of another team. Again, you know, preempt what's going to happen, respond to it, even if you can, before that, you know, think when you're doing your front lines, play devil's advocate, right? You should think about what the other team is arguing. Again, control the ground of the conversation within the debate. So also point out what are called fallacies. Um, you don't have to be like, this is the fallacy. Don't do that. Like, don't, don't do that. But 
when when you're thinking about what is being narrated within a debate, think about the things that are just like this. Don't make sense. This this is definitely there's a there's a hole within what they're saying, right? A fallacy is a mistaken belief, especially one based on un, an unsound argument. You know, something that doesn't seem right. There's a failure in the reasoning which ren which renders an argument invalid. So types of fallacies. Um, they uh, the, uh, clearly fail to provide adequate reasoning for believing the truth of their conclusion. So they didn't provide enough reasoning. Like there's things that are missing, you know, maybe there's something chronologically or in segment that was supposed to happen that didn't happen. Fallacies of unacceptable premise. So maybe there was a claim that was made that was just like, maybe has some pre, um, pre some pre, presupposition <laughs> can't talk today that makes some point that presupposes something um and so if there's a pre uh point then it, it can help you know direct a conclusion and maybe that you know maybe there's other conclusions that could have been made if that pre uh pre supposition was not made oh i cannot talk today <laughs> Formal fallacy. A formal fallacy is an argument with a premise and a conclusion that doesn't hold up to scrutiny. So if they're, again, thinking about those objections. So that argument should be thinking about scrutiny um, and should think about um, some of the things that may make that argument invalid um, that would commit it easily to unrecognizable logistical error. So a formal fallacy is just like, you know, you didn't even think about what your what the naysayers or what, you know, other things may be that would, you know, clearly and empirically uh, deny your point. Creating pathways to the W. So how can you make wins? Um, if you're going to talk about one isolated example, you should make the claim that this is um, anecdotal evidence. You should um, claim that one um, example should not be, one example does not help base policy. Assertions is if the team makes a claim without giving supporting evidence or reasoning. Like I, when people, like I always write like, how? I'm constantly asking how. People like, I saw for this. I'll be like, how? No one answers how. That's my, that's my biggest one. People like, we saw this, move on. Don't hit and run. I'll be like, how? You just move, you just hit and run. I told you can't do that. Don't hit and run. This, also, too, don't. This is not debate lullabies. Don't read to me. I can read to myself. Okay. Explain the heaven. If you're just reading some pre written thing all the way through, I'm going to go to sleep. This is a lullaby. Don't do that. So, really make sure you're doing what it takes to um, prove your argument to be true. Um, so, yeah, give that reasoning. Conclusionary evidence is if the team reads evidence which merely states that the conclusion of the author um, without the reason the evidence used to support that conclusion, then the validity of the claim cannot be assessed. This is a poor use of evidence and should be noted. So like, you know, if you're making conclusions from the evidence that doesn't, you know, stem from the reasoning that is being um, supported within the evidence, then that's conclusionary evidence. A bias source is, you know, again, sources that have affiliation or have um, conflict of interest, um, or maybe they're uncredible or no longer legitimate. So those are bias sources. Dates, again, we do this when it comes to politics, this says they should be three weeks new. Um, or, you know, again, as Ella has reminded us at the last practice, some people do it the night of. You know, um, I sometimes have been known to, I, I wasn't that, me, personally, some debaters would be like, mine was 2011, or or my or mine was, some people debate like, mine came out November 11th, and another team would be like, well, mine came out November 13th. To me, that's splitting hairs. I would always argue with the judge, that's splitting hairs. Really? You want to really evaluate their evidence because it's two days, two days? And depending upon, um, sometimes those days can win. But depending upon the inferences and the reasoning made, maybe the judge may prefer my date over theirs, depending on who's articulating the, the status quo the best or the current conditions the best, you know, or, or evaluating the current conditions the best or, or whatever. So sometimes those dates don't matter, but sometimes they do. Vague references, many times authors and will use the same word to refer to different ideas of situation. 
So you'd be like, oh, well, the, you know, it happened for Democrats, so it's going to happen for the Republicans. That's that's not, or, you know, it, as they say here, you know, this was a disaster for the Democrats, so it's going to be a disaster for the Republicans. Or like I said earlier, you know, you know, Russia, you know, can't keep up with the U.S., so that means China can't keep up with the uh, the U.S. That's no, can't just say that. First of all, those, they have two different ge geopolitical landscapes. So... Another one is no casualty. You know, sometimes people say that this causes that. You know, uh, um, sometimes evidence will refer to a correlation between events um, and say that there's the same cause. You know, that's not necessarily the case. I don't know what this example is, but yeah. All right, so that was just a tidbit about argumentation, how you should think about moving those pieces through the debate. In a formal way, you can also not just use this within debate. You, again, this is literary skills that are just fundamental to um, writing an essay or argumentative essay, or even an informal essay. Um, if you have information or if you want to get direct support about anything that you've seen here, it's in this presentation, or if you would like a copy of the slideshow to, again, review the slideshow along with me, maybe you're having some visual issues seeing this video or whatever, or whatever. Um, if you need any of the information or, you know, want to go over any of the information that you've seen here, join Slack, download Slack, get the, get the app, and then use this URL link here um, in order to get access to our channel where you get our programming announcements and will you get um, the ability to reach out to our staff, volunteers, and, and, and our community folk. And also some of the other debate folks like Ella, Daniel, and Sam who've signed up. And I think Har Harper's have also signed up for Slack. So if, um, it's a great way to work as a league and to work within your team um, teams. Um, and to get questions answered by, you know, again, those staff and those mentors that are there for you. If you want to shoot me an email um, for the novices, um, if you are a novice and you're watching this video, um, of course, Sakai should be able to answer some of these questions for you. Um, I'll send this over and place this within my personal work folder. So Shakai will have access to this. Um, if any novice wants to ask Sakai doing practice about this, um, or if you want to come back to me and ask me directly because I've led this lecture you can reach out to me there in fraser bay at bottle.org um if you want to just shoot me an email that's another way to get in contact with me and also that's the way where that's also where i send um your site information so if you have not received emails um about your school site where you actually have debate practices at your school it's a great way to get on my mailing email list because i do send emails weekly or at least bi-weekly to your school, to you yourself, um, pertaining to your actual debate team, your squad. Again, um, not just um, squad announcements, but also, um, again, you know, here's where we meet for our skill-based practices. Thursdays, you see, is four to six. That's how you were able to log in today. Wednesdays is four to six. That's how Benjamin and his, I mean, sorry, I called you Benjamin. Dan, Daniel, that's how Daniel um, was able to make it to practice yesterday when I wasn't there. Um, Y'all substituted with those Wednesday practices. And, you know, our middle school is there for those who, um, who are in middle school. If you have not registered for our program yet, any of you all, Sam, Ella, Daniel, Ellie, you have to be registered before our next tournament. Please use that QR code. Um, and for those who are watching, please use that QR code. You have to fill it out. If you fill it out last year, you have to fill out a new one this year. All right. And then lastly, as an announcement, um, here's where we meet um, Student Leadership Council on Fridays. If you're interested in those opportunities to travel, which I was talking about earlier in the announcements, you must come to those Friday sessions. Um, you are able to join us online. Here's the online information. You can also meet us in our office. We do provide lunch and travel reimbursement. For those who have not provided travel reimbursement, I'm so sorry. I'm going to um, definitely tomorrow get y'all clipper cards. Actually, that's what I need to do today when I leave. Oh, when I go to the Berkeley. I'm gonna get y'all clipper cards when I go to Berkeley today. I'm gonna have at least four. Um, so 
that will be made available to y'all who come to the office tomorrow. And then, yeah, that actually took a little bit longer because I went over a lot. I didn't think I was going to go over a lot. Um, I usually go over a lot during these sessions. So hopefully that was useful. Um, again, check out our refresher playlist if you're on our YouTube page to see, again, non-interactive videos. Also, you can check our skill-based practices where the interactive skill-based practices where I or others or our volunteers or you know anybody who's doing any instruction during these practices who are working with you all directly during this time that's allocated will also record these and place it within our skill-based practice playlist. So look out for those two playlists within our YouTube page. Before I shut this recording down, do any of you have any questions about any of the material that was covered? What's a switch side debate? No problem. Switch side debate is where you're thinking about um, the opposite of the argument, right? So if I say you cause nuclear war, the switch side of that is how would you not cause nuclear war, right? And of course, you would be thinking about the link because the link is talking about how you cause that to happen. So if they say that you do link, then switch side would be like, you know, and, and also thinking about like, how are they responding to what you're gonna say in opposition? So switch side is, is, is thinking about your argument in response, but also thinking about how, you're, how they're gonna respond to your response. So that's the switch side. It's like that back and forth. What does that back and forth look like? And you need to be thinking about that back, back and forth a lot earlier in the debate. Oh, this is the thing I want to mention. I'm glad you reminded me. I didn't say this earlier. Is thinking about that um, pyramid, like you're going to have your shallow arguments, your rudimentary arguments. And I know that some of y'all have been having problems with this, like, because I've given you some general strategies. Um, so for those of you who have, who have like very general front lines, yes, you, it should look a little blue at the top, right? But then it should get darker. Like it should be like sky blue here and then navy blue at the bottom as you get closer uh, to the end of the debate. But don't think about the end of the debate at the beginning of the debate. I mean, yes, think about the end of the debate at the, the end of the debate. So you should be thinking about your rebuttal doing the one and the R, right? And so the things that you know you're going to be stay, stating again in the rebuttal, punch those things that you're going to be restating in the one and R, like, uh, in the one and C. Like, punch it out. Like, this is really important because I'm going to be talking about it again later. Don't tell them you're going to be talking about it again later, but like, really punch it when you're giving your speech, right? Like, if you're if you're get, if you're saying you know whiteness is this de default cultural norm, then you're gonna be like whiteness is pervasive here because it does this. Whiteness is pervasive here. Look at it. It's just filling up space, judge. Right? Like you just wanna you wanna really evoke um, those arguments. And so um, again, you know, think about the debate round towards uh, the not toward don't you don't want to think about the debate round as it's ending. You want to think about the debate the debate round as if it's ended. In the one in, in the one and C, so you know what? Think about what is really going to stick within the debate. What is going to be the last thing that you're still that's going to remain true at the end of the debate? And when you're thinking again about your overviews or how you're going to create those larger arguments when you're making those conclusion conclusionary points or those um, introductory points, you're like, judge, the fact remains again this, right? That's where that kind of ties in together. Any other questions? Nope. All right. Well, see y'all later. Bye.